Welcome along to all strange historians and Beatles fans. This time around we're going to talk about the strange history of the Beatles song, I Am The Walrus. Before I begin, I want to thank some of my fellow strange historians and the strange AI stuff, all of whom helped me with some of this research that I'm going to be sharing with you. So sit back and pour yourself a cup of coffee, or a tankard of tea, or a mug of mead, or a chalice of cider, or a flagon filled with any beverage of your choice, and join your fellow strange historians and Beatles fans around the campfire. All right, let's get to the release. So I'm the Walrus was released by the Beatles as a single in November of 1967 with Hello Goodbye as its B-side. The single was a commercial success. It reached number one on the UK singles chart and number 56 on the US Billboard Hot 100. The song was also included on the Beatles 1967 album, Magical Mystery Tour, which was originally released as a double EP in the UK and a full length LP in the US. And Magical Mystery Tour was well received by critics and fans. It's considered a landmark album in the Beatles' career, right? One of many. Now, in addition to its initial release, I Am The Walrus has been included on numerous Beatles compilations and, you know, retrospective collections over the years. Its surreal and experimental sound has inspired countless musicians and artists in the years since its release. It remains a testament to the creative vision and the artistic daring of John Lennon and the Beatles as a whole. Now, since the Hello Goodbye single on the Magical Mystery Tour EP had reached the top two slots on the British Singles Chart in December, I Am The Walrus holds the distinction of reaching numbers one and two simultaneously. Shortly after its release, the song was actually banned by the BBC for the line, Boy, you've been a naughty girl. You let your knickers down. What's interesting about that is, and I don't know if anybody has any information on this, but also the BBC, I think at the time, at least, I don't know if it's still this way, didn't allow any advertising. And so I wonder if maybe you're also not allowed to use the word cornflake in a song, at the time anyway. So if anybody knows anything about that, please let me know in the comments below. Now let's talk about the marketing. I Am The Walrus was not originally released with an official, well, we call them today music video, right? Back then, promotional film. However, the song was featured in the Beatles' 1967 TV film, Magical Mystery Tour, which had the Beatles dressed in colorful, whimsical costumes, and they were performing the song against a backdrop of psychedelic visuals and really trippy special effects. Let's talk about the critical reception. The critics at the time really liked the song, right? And so the reception was largely positive. Writer Derek Johnson stated, this is a quote, John growls the nonsense and sometimes suggestive lyric backed by a complex scoring incorporating violins and cellos. You need to hear it a few times before you can absorb it. Definitely. So it's funny that he writes sometimes suggestive. So imagine once again if John Lennon would have left in the line waiting for the man to come. So uh, the showman named Nick Logan wrote the following. This is a quote. Into the world of Alice in Wonderland now and you can almost visualize John crouching on a deserted shore singing I am the walrus to some beautiful strings from far away on the horizon and a whole bag full of beetle sounds like a ringing doorbell and someone sawing a plank of wood. A fantastic track which you will need to live with for a while to fully appreciate. End quote. In a review for Melody Maker, uh, Nick Jones considered the song, this is a quote, not such a complex sound as a lot of previous Beatles stuff, but it builds nicely to a chattering, spinning cacophony of electricity and hissing gongs behind a barely audible conversation, end quote. Richard Goldstein of the New York Times wrote that the song, this is a quote here, their most realized work since A Day in the Life, and described it as a fierce collage with a musical structure that mirrors this fragmentation. In fact, he said it, uh, this is a further quote here, suggests a world much like that of a day in the life where the news is bad and John Lennon, now a walrus with a drooping mustache, would like to turn us on. Because he is an artist, he does. Now, as far as the influence of this song, I believe it was Jeff Lynne who once said that 
the idea, the inspiration for his entire band, Electric Light Orchestra, ELO, was to continue on where I'm the Walrus left off. And if you listen to some ELO songs, sure does seem that way. So here's some information that was provided to me by a fellow strange historian. So it says, I am the Walrus has had a profound influence on popular music and culture since its release in 1967. Here are some of the ways in which the song has made an impact. Experimental and avant-garde music. I am the Walrus is often cited as an early example of experimental and avant-garde music in the popular sphere. The song's complex and layered instrumentation use of unusual sounds and effects, and nonsensical lyrics helped to push the boundaries of what was considered acceptable in pop music at the time. The Beatles were closely associated with the psychedelic and countercultural movements in the 1960s, and I Am the Walrus was seen as a major contribution to these movements. The song's surreal and trippy imagery, hey, I use that word, as well as its playful and irreverent attitude resonated with many young people who were disillusioned with the mainstream culture at the time. And then it talks about influence on other artists. It says, I'm the Walrus has been cited as an influence on numerous artists and musicians over the years, including David Bowie, Radiohead, Oasis, and The Flaming Lips, among others. Yeah, like ELO. Uh, the song's experimental and adventurous spirit has inspired many artists to push the boundaries of their own music and explore new sounds and ideas. And then it talks about the legacy in the popular culture. I'm the Walrus has become a cultural touchstone and an enduring symbol of the Beatles' creativity and originality. Heck yeah, I think we can all agree with that. And then it says, the song has been referenced and parodied in numerous films, TV shows, and other forms of media over the years and continues to be celebrated and revered by fans and critics alike. And so, what can we learn? And so prior to doing this show, I asked some of my fellow strange historians, who are Beatles fans, to please send me some information about, you know, what they think can be learned from this song. And so here's what was sent to me. It says, The importance of experimentation. I Am The Walrus is a prime example of the power of experimentation in music. The song's unconventional structure, unusual sounds, and nonsensical lyrics were all the result of John Lennon's willingness to take risks and push the boundaries of what was considered acceptable in pop music at the time. By being open to new ideas and unafraid to try something different, John Lennon and the Beatles created a truly groundbreaking and innovative piece of music. There's also a bit here about the value of collaboration, and here's what it says. Although I Am the Walrus was primarily written by John Lennon, it was also the result of collaboration with other members of the Beatles as well as producer George Martin. The song's complex arrangement and intricate instrumentation required input and contributions from all involved, demonstrating the power of teamwork and collaboration in creating great music. Definitely. And then, got a final paragraph here. It says, the importance of creativity and originality. It says, I am the walrus, is a testament to the importance of creativity and originality in music. Well, let me just tell you, <laughs> I'm recording this in 2023. Not much creativity and originality in music these days, right? We've fallen from great heights. Uh, let me continue on. It says, the song's surreal and imaginative lyrics, as well as its inventive and experimental sound, helped to establish the Beatles as one of the most innovative and influential bands of all time. By striving to be creative and original in their work, the Beatles were able to produce music that continues to captivate and inspire listeners to this day. Excellent. I love that. You know, everybody, for future shows, if any of my fellow strange historians want to put together scripts or send me information, bits and pieces here and there, please let me know. If you want credit, I'm happy to give it to you. For some reason, a lot of people don't want credit. They're like, no, here we go. Here's what I found or whatever it is. But, you know, I'm more than happy to collaborate as well. There's so many different types of shows to do and there's so many things to talk about. It's impossible for one person to do everything. So if anybody's interested in talking about the Beatles or any other subjects that you think our fellow strange historians would be interested 
in, please don't hesitate at all to contact me. Um, a good way to contact me, by the way, is to join Patreon. And you can send me a message directly because I will certainly be able to catch those a lot quicker and easier than I will on, let's say, Instagram or Twitter or, you know, or YouTube. So, and, and even emails. It's difficult. I get so many. But uh, Patreon I pay particular attention to. So there's that. And so this concludes this episode of The Strange History of I Am The Walrus. I'd love to know what you think of the song. Do you like it? Do you hate it? How do you feel when you listen to it? What images and memories do you associate with listening to the song? What do you think some of the lyrics mean? Do you agree with what John Lennon tried to say that the song means nothing? There's nothing to it. It's all nonsense. Don't pay attention to anything. It was just silliness. It's, it's designed to confound people. It's designed to not be interpreted. Do you think that was the case or do you think John Lennon really did have a lot of meaning in his songs? And sometimes he knew about it, sometimes he didn't know about it. And so please share your thoughts in the comments below. And if there are other songs, like I said, you'd like for me to discuss, please let me know. If you enjoyed the video, kindly like, share, and subscribe. And hit the notification bell here on my channel. And please become a member of my channel. I'd really, really appreciate it. Uh, it's really good for the whole algorithm thing with YouTube. The more members I have, the more likes I get, the more comments. If you could leave comments on my videos, that would really be helpful. It helps YouTube's algorithm. There's no human there. You know, it's all kind of, we're at their mercy. You know, the, the AI. And so, the more interaction that it sees, the better. If you want to support my research, if you want to hear more shows like this, please click on the link below so you can see how you can make a donation directly to me and also how you can join me on other platforms where I post exclusive content. There's stuff like this, but there's also exclusive stuff. Also, kindly be kind to all non-human animals. Please don't eat them. Please don't eat them. Horrible. If you knew what they, they went through, so you could eat them, it, it, it's horrifying. Anybody with a kind heart wouldn't um, do something like that. So anyway, uh, please be kind to all non-human animals. And please do yourself a favor and go to a local shelter and adopt a cat or a dog. You'll be very glad that you did. Until next time, I wish you safe travels on all your journeys.